welcome to the Ultimate Coach Podcast, Conversations from Being, inspired by the book, The Ultimate Coach, written by Amy Hardison and Alan Thompson. Join us each week with the intention of expanding your state of being, and your experience will be remarkable. Remember, this is a podcast about being. It is a podcast about you. To explore more deeply, visit theultimatecoachbook.com. Now, enjoy today's conversation from B. Welcome to another episode of the Ultimate Coach Podcast. I'm Meredith Bell, one of the hosts for the show. And today I am so excited to welcome as my guest, Mike Coates. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you for having me here today. You know, Mike, there are so many things that we'll be talking about that I know our listeners will benefit from, and I want to encourage them to get out a notepad or uh, something to write on, because I just know from our earlier conversations, there's so much for you to share that will be so beneficial to people who are focused on who they are being in the world. And so I'd like to start with just having you tell us, how did you come to learn about Steve Hardison and you've coached with him? How did all that happen? Sure. Thank you. And, and, um, and, and first, I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for your, your, your thoughtful questions and your just your loving demeanor and the place you come from. It's just, it's so refreshing on every podcast I've heard and in our calls in the past. And I'm just really excited to be with you today. And how I came to know of Steve Hardison, it uh, originally came through Steve Chandler and Steve Chandler's book writings. Uh, all the books that he writes about, some epiphany or some aha that he that he had for his home life that he took to his coach. And I was forever intrigued. I, I think the book that stuck out to me the most was Right Now, that mastering the present moment and being yes. in that present moment. And I just remember when I read that, I that book, there was, I don't even remember the story, but there was a feeling that I just, I knew one day uh, I wanted to be with Steve. And I looked at his website and I said, no way, that's impossible. And just kind of put it on the shelf for a while until that day finally came. And when I did, um, I worked with Steve Chandler um, for a number of years, and he was phenomenal and helped me to see things that I didn't see. And ultimately, uh, being with Steve Hardison was just a true blessing. It was just a true blessing that that it could be in the loving presence uh, of somebody that's that's really done the work and is really shining his light brightly to help others see their own. Mm-hmm. And I know that you've read and studied the book of being the ultimate coach. In fact, you've shared it with your family as well. I would love for you to talk about what were some of the key takeaways for you from that book and what impact did they have in your decisions about who you wanted to be? Yeah, thank you for that. I I did. I read the book last year five times. um, And as I went through the went through the book, it was also while I was working with Steve. And I will tell you, I had so many insights from the book <laughs> itself and seeing something new about me. Some of the, you know, one of the most significant ones was early on with my relationship uh, with with Jill, my my wife, and I would refer to her as as my wife Jill in the past, and now she's my girlfriend. That was one of the biggest insights is creating day, the daily creation of our relationship and seeing the way Steve and Amy create each other was an example to me, um, you know, from the standpoint is that we have four children. Life gets busy and there's a lot of things that happen. Fortunately, we had a lot of really good, healthy habits for our relationship uh, of communication and dreaming together and making time for each other. But the opportunity, the biggest opportunity that I saw from Steve's example and through the book of being was the daily creation of my relationship with Jill. 
and it it happened very quickly as we started as I started intentionally bringing that to my consciousness every day so much that um, we ended up remaking her wedding ring. Um, I think the first time that I read it, uh, that we came through and we realized that she had, um, she had a wedding ring. We've been married 16 years and she had an allergic reaction several years ago to the white gold on her, on her wedding ring. And so she wasn't wearing it for the last four or five years because it would cause her finger to swell up. And, you know, we just, you know, she would wear it sometimes, but then it would cause it to swell up. And then we just, we didn't do anything about it. And something in that story of the creation of our relationship and honoring our lives together under God um, just really got highlighted. And we went and remade her, her wedding ring into platinum. And that was a symbol of renewal um, and rejuvenation in our relationship in a whole new way. That was that was the biggest thing that that really sticks out to me at the at the beginning of reading the book of being. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about when you say girlfriend versus wife. What is that distinction for you? Why does that make a difference in in using one term versus the other? Yeah, so I I, I use a number of I guess you could say terms and words. It's it's more fun. It's joyful. It's playful. It's interesting. Um, Jill, I have the, just the awesome pleasure of living with my girlfriend, my best friend, my soulmate and a saint all under one roof. I do. And I'm, there's not one ounce of joking with that. There is the woman I live with and spend my life with is so incredible. And I have so much deep respect and admiration that she pours into our children in such a powerful way uh, as we are leading whole soul school for our children and more on that later. But the other piece too, is, is that she cares for all of our nutrition, making food from scratch. She pours our heart and soul into, into each of us. And it's, and it's, when I watch her and I see her and I really see her and what she's doing and where she's coming from as she's doing that, it it just I just have such a deep, profound appreciation for her. And all all the while, while she's while she's doing this, she's caring for our dog Teddy, who's been paralyzed last November, and she has to excrete his bladder every day. She mm -hmm. has to feed him. She stretches him and exercises him. And this is while helping to pursue all of our kids individual passions and helping them to to light up the things that interest and most excite them while connecting them with friends and other people and really creating our time together our prayer life is every day and that we connect together in that way uh that has been recreated through the through the, the standpoint of being that playful, joyful spirit, when I say girlfriend, when I say soulmate, when I say best friend. And oh, by the way, she's doing all of this while taking the University of Santa Monica. She's completing her second year of that program, hmm. not for any other purpose than just being more true to herself as a, as a wife, mother, daughter, sister, and friend. And that inspires me beyond belief. Hmm. I hear that love coming through loud and clear. And I was sitting here thinking how lucky your children are to witness parents who love and honor each other in such a powerful way. So thank you for being such a great role model for your kids. And speaking of your kids, you brought three of your four children to have individual sessions with Steve Hardison. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. And so I'd love for you to share with our listeners what caused you to decide to do that and what did you see as being the impact of them each having that day with him? Yeah, thank you for that insight. And I was reflecting on where that came from. And that actually came through one of the times I read the Book of Being. Uh, there were a couple of things that stuck out to me when I read when I read the book, and it just I just kind of put them in the back of my mind of like, huh, like one of them was when Steve 
saw his father, I think he was about five or six years old, and he was looking out over at the mountains. And he asked, he said, Dad, can I go out? Let's go out to the mountains. And he said, yeah, something to the effect of, yes, and I'll take you there. And then he never saw his dad again as a broken promise. Then later in the book, there's a vignette by Gary Mahler about how he went uh, with his son and daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm like, huh. And then there was a third that stuck out to me when when Steve talked about his time at Rodell when he took uh, his daughter, Lindsay, uh, to Delaware because he had a work trip over her birthday. So he took her with him on her birthday to go celebrate and be with her at that point. I'm like, well, why, why can't I do that? Even better yet, how can I do that instead of creating why I can't? Um, and that's where the idea kind of surfaced for me. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I took them and they got to see what I'm experiencing for themselves. And it wasn't just like, hey, I get to take them with me for a coaching session and just and show up. I, I had to create that with Steve and then go back and create that with each one of my children that they had to do the work. They had to, they had to do the work. We, had, we read the book of being together. They had to memorize their documents and know them inside and out and really embody those. And you know, a clear intention or purpose of why they wanted to do that. And so it wasn't something I was going to make them do, but I offered those things up to them. And I said, hey, then we'll do a one-on-one trip, just me and you for the weekend. Of course, we're going to go for the session with Steve, and then we get to spend some time together um, and just go and play and explore. And so that's where the idea was birthed. And uh, towards the end of my uh, agreement with Steve is, where I had each of them come on separate trips with me. And we didn't know how long it was going to take. They had their own session with Steve. I talked maybe 5% of the time and it was all Steve and them and the way he poured into them and the way they lit up and shared from their heart, what they wanted and where they were uh, was just incredibly beautiful. It was a really beautiful experience. And I think it'd be interesting to share how old you're, three children were at the time of those visits? Sure, sure. My 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 son, Zachary, uh, was 12. Um, my my daughter, Eleni, was 10. Actually, she was, yeah, she was 10 when we went on the on the trip. And uh my younger son Samuel was six at the time. And um it it was really, really beautiful that they had the expressions from their souls that they that they shared and really helped to light them up. They they saw one of the most cool things as a father was to see was asking them why they wanted to go. What did, was it they wanted to get out of their session with Steve? And both my older son and daughter, 12 year old and 10 year old, individually and separately told me that they wanted to have a better relationship with each other, that they wanted to have a better, more loving relationship with each other. That's what they shared with me. I can sure say that those weren't thoughts that were going through my mind at that age. Like that was, that was uh, really incredible. That's what was on their heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what they got to see. They got to see how they can create that more intentionally going forward. And they got to see that everybody has a different point of view and it doesn't have to be the same as their point of view and that they're going to disagree. They will get upset and that's okay. And they can move on from that. Mm -hmm. Now there's no magic wand in our house. Like that's our area of growth. Every day is our relationship and who we're being with each other and how we're showing up. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point. Mike, so we don't put you and your kids on a pedestal and say, oh, they've got it all together. Please don't. <laughs> you know, that because the reality is we're all human beings and there are things we're going to experience. What I love, though, about what you're sharing is the, the thoughtfulness and the awareness. I think of so many of us adults, you know, in our adult life, we didn't realize some of these aspects of thinking about where are we coming from? Who are we being? And for kids to develop that at such a young age, the power of that in terms of how they show up in the world, what they're prepared to deal with, 
is just remarkable. And I know one of the other things that you mentioned is they each had prepared their own individual documents. And now in your home, you all are really emphasizing the power of those individual documents. And I would love for you to talk about how do you bring those to life in your family each day? Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, we naturally, one of the things that Jill and I have habitually done is things that impact our lives is we we talk about them in the home. We talk about them with our kids. We share things with our children constantly. Um, and one of those is is our document. And as I first shared mine with my family, it was really cool to see. I didn't have to ask them to be quiet. I didn't have to ask them to, you know, can you listen to this? Is they were attentive and they listened and they listened from a deep way. And it was about a year and a half ago where I sat down with with each of them separately and helped them to create theirs through the frustrations, limitations, irritations that they experienced in any part of their lives and helped them to create their new truth. And as we as we did that, they started practicing them themselves. And we would we would initially start um, in the evenings before we go to bed. We'd have them share their document. Uh, we'd pray and read stories and then share other documents. And that's been continually evolving over time to the point where we're at now is the blessing of, of soul school. It's, it's homeschooling without a curriculum. We're all in, a, in the same environment. So we get to create ourselves in the morning. We're all here together. We have a more fluid morning here together. And so we speak our documents out on a daily basis in front of each other, in front of the whole family. And it's interesting how it's done. All of our kids do it a little bit differently. My younger two like to sing it and dance it like as they sing it. Like they just, they kind of perform it. They're, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Like they, I mean, it's all coming from them. And um, they, they sing it, they, they share it. And, and now we're seeking to reinforce hearing it in front of each other. And what we've created is an acknowledgement jar. So we have a ball glass jar sitting on the counter where um, where we want to catch each other being what we're creating. And so catch each other with each other, demonstrating being your word, being your document in some way. And so when we do catch each other in there, we acknowledge each other. We write it on a little sticky note. I know the uh, listeners can't see this, but I have these little sticky notes. I pulled a couple out of the jar um, in case we were going to talk about this. And we we write it on there and we uh, say what it's for and what, what declaration it leads to and put it in there. And the thought is, is once we reach about 50 in total, that we'll do something cool with the family. And um, it all comes and goes in waves. And we're trying to encourage healthy habits of not only knowing your own document, but really listening of what is each person creating in their life and acknowledging for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so powerful to reinforce what it is each person has stated about who they are. And I think you're doing another, you're kind of taking it to another level in getting those printed so that they're going to be visible for each other, right? Talk a little bit yeah. about what you're doing there. Yeah, that's, that's that. Thank you for that. That's the other piece. We, we have them printed out on with their images on just regular sheets of paper that we put in a plastic sleeve because everything gets destroyed sooner or later in our, in, in our house. And so those, those are floating around. But what we realize is that we want to have them more visible and we're going to we're going to blow them up on a, either on a bigger frame or a canvas and put all six of ours on the on the wall in the kitchen. Um, because we, we realize that some of us, including Jill and I, we have quite a few declarations on ours. And so do our older two children our, our younger two. They they have maybe a half dozen dozen mm -hmm. at most. Ours are quite a few more. And it's 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 hard to remember each other's. And so we want to make it visual. And put it in a place where we can go up and look and help to make that connection visually, not just auditorily or remembering it. 
And that's 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 uh, that's the next page in our journey that we're actually we're we're working on now um, to to find a great way to display it. That's that's so cool. I love that it, because I was just reading um, uh, Atomic Habits by James Clare and talking about when you want to get a new habit in place, making it obvious, and so putting it in your environment so you see it often. That to me is just a great example of making that a habit so that you notice each one. And because you have a, a purpose behind it of these acknowledgements with I Ching is so powerful. To me, one of the things I admire most, Mike, about what you've just been describing is that the fact is you're creating children who are looking for the positives and looking for the good in others because you're not focused on criticizing where they're falling short, which happens in so many homes and why we have so many adults that have issues with self-esteem because they were never good enough. And I love the emphasis that you're putting on with this whole environment you're creating in your home of recognizing not just the declaration somebody has made, but how they're putting that into practice. And so you're reinforcing the behavior you want to see in them. It's just a magnificent way of being as parents. And I want to really hold that up to you and to our listeners, because I think it's so powerful. And we can do that with everyone in our lives. When we look at, and that's part of what you said earlier about creating Jill every day is how do we want to see this person so that we don't let our own filters uh, create a distortion that's going to have them be less than what they could be. So I just love the way you're growing your children into their own individual magnificent ways of being. One of the other things I wanted to talk to you about today, because I think it's so contrary to what we're taught in the world, is this whole idea of planning. And in fact, a lot of your work is focused on helping entrepreneurs create plans. But in your own life, you had told me you weren't focused on planning so much anymore. So talk about how did you make that shift and what are you focused on now instead of that? Sure. Thank you. I, yeah. I, I, um, before sharing that, just one last comment on the previous piece is uh, about sharing our, our declarations with each other. One, it's great that they are sharing it with each other and that they're doing that. Really, the real reason in that, it helps me. It brings it to the forefront of me of what I want to be looking for in them. Mm. Because by default, when something gets, when somebody's rolling on the floor and we're trying to get out of the house and get in the car, the natural response is irritation. I'm frustrated. We've got to go. And the more that I lean into and see their words that are created, it's, it's helping me more than anything to start looking for that in a new way. And so it's, it's first, it starts with me. And then I hope that that ripples throughout them. So I'm not doing it for them to start fixing something first. I'm doing it for me first and Jill first for us to intentionally create that and then see how that flows from there. My hope is that they would, you know, they see the best in that and, and, and light up. Um, I can't control them, nor do I want to. And I hope that they see that and feel that energy and, and naturally take that would be would mm. be mm -hmm. a great point. Thank you for adding that. Sure. And, and back to your question about planning, um, a, a little bit of context first on, on, on planning is um, so I, I I'm an engineer by education. I uh, had ran my plan, my family's business for for seven years. And um, and then became a, a a coach for entrepreneurial leadership teams using a methodology called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And in that, I would coach leadership teams of entrepreneurial companies, which I still do today. I've done that for eleven years, and I help them define a vision and plan, and help them build team health to help them just be in a healthy way of being with each other. I wouldn't have used those words years ago. 
um, in that way. Um, but um, so there was there's a lot of planning, a lot of goal setting, a lot of intention, a lot of clarity of, of moving. What is the path forward? And then how do we get there? And I got very good at that and really helped a lot of people and still continue to so much of the fact that I love these the tools so much. I started using them in our home life. Like I was telling you before, we like to integrate things into our home life. And so Jill and I used um, similar principles that I was using in the business world in our family life of defining our vision, defining our plan, defining our communication rhythm, and how do we communicate and build a healthy relationship with us so that like in a business, you have a leadership team and the team, everybody else follows that leadership team for better or worse. Same thing in a family. You have a leadership team of the parents or the adults in the house. The kids follow you for better or worse. They, they see how you act and behave and what you say and whether those are in alignment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have to tell them. They know. And so as we were doing that in our lives, we, we got really good at defining our goals and setting goals and going out and get them or, or not get them. And we would go out and get really good at, at getting clear and moving forward. And so much that other couples came to us and asked us how we were doing this. And we built a program called the Purposeful Family Manager for four years and helped entrepreneurial couples, people with the entrepreneurial spirit to bring a set of healthy disciplines and behaviors to their home life. And um, I never realized how much energy and effort that I was expending in that part of my life. I, I was getting really good at integrating work life, home life, and creating a, a really good blend and discipline of time off and everything else over time. But I never realized how much energy that was that was taking from me until um, my coach at the time a few years ago was Michael Neal. And he asked me a question when I shared with him uh, what we were doing in our own life. I, I shared with him my, my personal plan, my business plan, all this like, check this out. This is can you help me with all this stuff? And I, there was nothing broken or wrong. But I would I, I just showed him what, what I've gotten. And he just looked at me and he said, why are you doing this? And I, I, I didn't have any words. I was, I, I just, I said, I, I'm stuttering like I am right now. Like this is what this is what it is. I just said, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Um, and another piece of background that's important is I'm a man of faith. I always know that inside of me, and I'm pointing to my head right now. I know intellectually that happiness comes from inside of me, and that it, that it's, that it's. I'm already happy. It's already there. What I didn't realize is that through the way I was relating to goal setting and the way I was relating to setting a plan, that I was unconsciously putting my happiness out in front of me somewhere into the future. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that, for example, when I have, um, when my bank balance reached a certain amount, like when I, have a certain amount in the bank, then we can go buy something for the house. We can then go on a vacation that we've wanted to go on. When I get another client or two, then we could have more time off. And so there was some kind of like future relief or future breath of air that I would have when Mm. XYZ was done um, or delegated or what have you. And I didn't realize that I was the way I was relating to goal setting at the time was making it everything about the goal and was making it everything about the plan. And I was putting my happiness on whether unintentionally, whether I achieved it or not, was either going to make me more happy or less happy as what the action or behavior that I was demonstrating. And when I, when I realized that all in that moment of, of clarity for myself, um, Jill and I were on vacation like that following week. And I, I had a conversation with her, just realizing that epiphany and just saying, why are we doing this? We're creating a lot of stuff for us to do. Like, do we, why, why are we doing this? We have some really good, healthy behaviors. So we, we, we stopped the intentional planning in our personal and family life. And we said that 
realizing that if happiness, if I truly believe dropping from my head to my heart, that happiness is really inside of me, then I've got everything I need in the present moment. And the present moment will give more to what's being created in a more miraculous, divine way than what my head, what my brain could intellectually plan and analyze and figure out. And so for me, leaning into the miraculous present moment became our new way of living. Mm -hmm. And it was very freeing. It was very, very freeing from the standpoint is that there was all of a sudden a newfound like inspiration and energy that part of may have been consumed with all the intellectual analytical stuff in perfectionism that a habit of perfectionism that I've had in the past mm. still creeps in. And I know that was a well-worn habit in the past. Intentionally it was coming from a good place. Um, but I just see it differently now. And as I see, I see that. I was just going to say, just hearing you talk about it, I feel this lightness of the the heaviness of that plan and sticking with it and seeing it through compared to, and, and I love that word, that phrase, the miraculous present moment and being able to respond to that. I know enough about habits and behavior that we get wired, you know, where there's physical wiring in our brain for these habits and patterns that we've established. And so while you had that epiphany, I have to imagine it wasn't all of a sudden that you made this abrupt shift from planning to no planning and the miraculous present moment. So what was that transition like? What what level of awareness, what what work did you have to do? If you had to do any, I'm not making an assumption here, but I'm just assuming it took some time to shift that pattern. It took a little bit. It was surprisingly shorter than than I would have thought it would be. I mean, if if you a few years ago, if you had asked me that this is the way I would be living my life or the mindset or the spirit that I'd be coming from, I'd, I'd probably look at you like you're nuts. Um, and so that transition, um, you know, what I, what I realized it's planning for me was a well-worn habit. It was a well, well-intended habit. And I can see it also as an addiction. I can mm-hmm. see it also as an addiction. I'm going to use that word intentionally because what that habit did that I didn't realize because of the emphasis that I put on it. Now, I'm not condu- like saying that planning and goal setting is wrong. It's useful. But if it's everything about the goal setting and plan first, not so useful from what I see. And so the addiction part is putting that that energy into something that um, trying to calm my mind down to know that how I'm going to feel at some point in the future. Like I'm trying to arrange and put it all together, Mm -hmm. know that everything's okay and provide a sense of security, safety and comfort in knowing how it's all going to work out. And we tried dumbing it down at first to a very simplified version. We created like that week of what we were doing. And we just, we never looked back on it. We just, honestly, we just stopped. I, it, it, an insight for us, when it truly comes from within, like certain things just don't make sense anymore. And we just, we didn't continue on in that in that way. Now, we'd have conversations when they were needed. Instead of having a regular weekly meeting like we did in our, in our house before, we meet, we meet when we want to. We meet when we have things that we want to tackle. We know that we've developed a lot of great healthy habits in the past, and we don't need to be so rigid about them. We don't, and it's not about that. It's about staying connected, mm. staying engaged, coming from love. Mm-hmm. Did you see any difference in your kids' behaviors when you made that shift? Was there any change in the family dynamic? There, there was, 
because I, I, I think it was a direct reflection of us, namely me, <laughs> loosening up. <laughs> mm. It was me not feeling like I needed to control my environment or stuff to a, such a rigidity uh, place where I started to just uh, loosen up a little bit. And as mm -hmm. I loosen up a little bit, I know that that in turn gave permission for everybody else to breathe and loosen up a little bit mm -hmm. in, their, in their own way. Mm -hmm. And things are flowing. Yeah, the word I'm hearing it, that's coming to me as I'm listening to you is you you decided to focus on allowing. Yeah. Allowing things to emerge rather than forcing or trying to make them be a particular way through control. Absolutely. It's it's allowing. And that triggered a thought for me in our great room. We have three signs on our bookshelf. One says surrender. The other one says let go. And the other one says right now. <laughs> So when we look to those things, whenever I get tied up in a knot or things aren't happening the way that my mind thinks that they should be happening or it's I'm disturbed, my peace is disturbed inside. It's a good visual reminder for us to, for me, when I say us, it's me first, to surrender to right to the present moment. And allow what's happening to happen. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to like it. But if I don't accept what's happening right now is as it's happening, um, I'm trying to deny reality. I'm trying to de de deny the miraculous present moment. And then I'm missing it. Mm -hmm. I'm caught up in the way I think it should be or the way it was. And I'm what I, I'm not going through life missing right now. Like that's that that's that's at the root of the decision that the shift I saw and the insight that I saw in my life. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love those three plaques that you've got. I'll I'll keep those as a mental uh, image in my own mind because I think that's so helpful when, especially when we're presented with behavior or a situation that is not something we would have requested or wanted or envisioned was a positive, but to, to see it differently and get to acceptance really quick. I love what Chris Dora says about none time, the, the difference in time between when something happens and when you accept it. If you can get that down to none time, you get to a place of calmness, peace, surrender, letting go all so quickly. Because it's the reality, like you say, and I love that. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about, because most of our listeners are involved in some kind of work that they're doing, and you have modified the way you work with your clients now because of this shift from focusing on planning, even though you still do it, I think there's a difference in the way you approach it with them. And I'd love for you to talk about that. I think that would have great relevance for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For, for me, it's, I, I come from a different place now. I, I know it without a doubt. And I know that um, not every client is open to it from the entrepreneurial leadership team side of, of the work I do. And I do know that. So I created an environment we're part of the creation of living into the miraculous present moment has allowed new creations better than I could have ever have planned. One being the house that we're living in with the sacred session space that I'm doing this podcast from right now. This is where I meet with all of my entrepreneurial leadership teams. I come to my house inside my house in a sacred space that was dedicated for this work them and all of my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients and the creation of the space. And I share this with them. There's a couple of things that in the way that I approach this um, when I'm working with, with teams is first is I have everybody take their shoes off at the door. I give them a heads up. They're going to have to take their shoes off. They're coming in. 
And when they take their shoes off, I thank them and acknowledge them for that. And they come and sit down and they know like the first time they do it, they're feeling a little like weird, like what? Like we're in a business meeting and I'm taking my shoes off. And I say, thank you. Thank you for doing that. This is a sign of vulnerability, willing to let your guard down, take your armor off, taking your shoes off is symbolism of doing that. And then I, then I see a, a, just a breath, a lightness just kind of come over them in that, in that way. And it, it allows for a more comfortable conversation on some things that are otherwise rather tenuous. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I now come from and share is that I, I share with them why I created what we created here. We have this sacred space with a great view in nature on a lake, a little bit out of the city area. And what, what I share with them is that this room, this place is created to be a blessing, number one. It's to bless our Lord, to bless our family, to bless each client and every person that enters this place. And it's layered with unconditional love, unlimited possibility in the fertile ground where miracles get created in every single session. And as you can imagine, it's not so surprising for some one-on-one clients to hear that. For some business leadership teams hearing that for the first time, I had one gentleman in a session. It's like, you're talking about miracles. Like you might want to not talk about miracles. And, and he was a very rigid planner engineer and he loosened up so much in that day. It was unreal. He started seeing the gray between the black and the white. And his team was joking with him and having fun with him. And he's never experienced that in his life in that way. And there wasn't any one thing that did it. It's a combination of the place of allowance that I know that I'm coming from. I know I don't have the answers. I don't need to have all the answers. And I know that when we create that in a way together, that miracles will surface between everybody in the room. And it's all about the relationships and how we're coming together in the room. That's the biggest thing that that we do. And when we create goals and plans and strategies from that place, from a fertile ground, not a rock hard foundation, like we have some fertile soil then that we can then grow with intention, what we want, instead of trying to plant a seed on a rock and let it wash away the the second they get back in the middle of their crazy day-to-day, they actually come back the next quarter completely different people. And it's incredible. That's amazing. And you weave into that, I would guess, this whole idea of who you're being. It, because I think that's a, it's such an important part of you, where you're coming from, who you're being. <clears throat> Do you have a process that you use with them, either individually or in a group, to help them realize that without you, you know, quote, lecturing them about it or trying to describe it to them? How do you help them see it? Um I don't have a structure, system, or formal process. Uh, what I what I see is I look for opportunities. I, I look for opportunities. There, there's always conflict, irritation, annoyances, or disturbances um, between each other, between something going on with their employees, between something going on with their spouse or their kids, like these things surface. We create a safe, sacred environment for for these, we call them issues, to surface. It's just an issue. And I use those as opportunities. And again, I'm pointing to my head and to my heart to help integrate your head and your heart in this place. A lot of times people are here for their passion or for their zest or for wanting something and they're stuck in their head. They're stuck with something not working right. And usually what I see is there's a blockage between the two. There isn't this, this continuous flow and harmony and partnership between the head and the heart. And as we slow down and start exploring that, I'll get curious. 
I'll just get very curious and start asking questions and helping them to see what it is that they're what's causing their stuckness. I don't lecture. I don't teach unless there's something that would serve from that from that place. Because I find even through my experience of tying in home life with Jill at the University of Santa Monica, USM, is all an experiential led program. There's core principles, but the way that we they learn the principles and the way that I learned the principles from attending their loyalty for your soul workshop was it's all experiential. It's like you bring up something that's going on in your life and then they help to facilitate you through deeper inquiry. And then once you see it for yourself, all of a sudden you cannot see it mm. and you shift faster and more indefinitely than if somebody else said, go do this or go do that. And that's the best example or way that I can describe what, if I had a process, that's what the process would would look mm-hmm. like. It's form mm-hmm. and formless at the same time. Mm-hmm. That makes perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. Just thinking about being fully present right now and discovering what's happening in this particular moment. And what to me is underlying everything you're talking about is how can I serve this person in the most powerful way? <clears throat> Mike, this has been such a remarkable conversation. Is there anything else that has kind of come into your mind as we've been talking that you would like to share before we wrap up? Yeah, one one, one other piece um, that tends to rattle pages of, of, of clients is having my session room in my house. And I mean, my family's here. We're, we're homeschooling. We call it soul, soul school because we're following their own individual passions and um, desires as their curriculum. And so they're they're here in their house. And I know a, a lot of clients are nervous about come, like your family's going to be there. Like we're meeting in your house. They can't quite wrap their minds around it. And it's cool because this goes back to my planning days is that I got really good at planning business and home life in integrating the two. And what I realized is that I saw the oneness in everything and everyone, my deep connection to God, who is in nature, who is in every human being, who's in business and in home life, because it's not separate, it's all one. And so when I realized I was separating business and home life, by creating a barrier, I would then go around and integrate the two and spend a bunch of energy separating it and then integrating it without realizing it. And the more that I realized that everything is one, just dissolving, slowly dissolving those barriers that I had artificially put in my mind, everything starts to flow and integrate so much better. And that is a core reason for why I'm doing this in my house, because it was a growth edge for me and an Mm. area for me to learn to dissolve. And as I do that, we're just living our life and everything that's in it is all part of it flowing from wherever we're at on our travels around the world, here in other areas. Like we're doing our life, living our life, creating our way of family for us and serving wherever we go in the way that we can. And that for me was a big insight and continues to be as as I start to see the the oneness in everything and everyone always. Hmm. That's a beautiful place to to wrap up. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's such an important takeaway for all of us that it all it is all one. And to not make those distinctions and, and have to expend energy keeping them separate. I love your word dissolve. I think that's great. Mike, thank you for the gift of you and everything that you shared today. Such wisdom, such life learnings and experiences that people can listen to and have takeaways right now to um, incorporate into their own way of being that I think will enrich their lives in the same way you're pulling together all these 
learnings and lessons have enriched your life, Jill's life, and that of your children and everyone that you all come in contact with. So thank you for who you are being in the world. Thank you, Meredith. It's been such a blessing being with you today and your thoughtful questions and inquiry. And I I feel it from my heart and deeply and grateful for this time together. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you know someone who would benefit from today's conversation, please share this podcast with them. Also, we invite you to visit theultimatecoachbook.com so you can continue your personal exploration of being. There you will find links to join our wonderful community, get your own copy of The Ultimate Coach Book, and more. Simply go now to www.theultimatecoachbook.com. That's www.theultimatecoachbook.com. The link is also available in the show notes. We appreciate your support. Be blessed. Be you.